I really hoped I'd be a bit more prepared for this speech, but it's going to be off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Um, I've had about four days with five hours sleep now um, because um, New Zealand basically instigated a movement called Candles for Assange back in July last year when we celebrated Julian's birthday. And we got, we invited the world with a candle display. We said, come on world, join us for Julian's birthday, but let's fight for free press. And a staggering, one, in one week's time, we had 50 cities. By the day of the event, which was two weeks' time, we had 62 cities joining Wellington. And I couldn't get it in the media at all. It was a disgrace. Um, I'd sent press releases out. I, I rang up RNZ. They asked me to spell Assange. Okay. It, it got me so furious. <laughs> um, I really wanted them to know how much New Zealanders were fighting for this but no one was hearing their story. Um, so, Free Assange New Zealand is on Facebook, Candles for Assange is on Facebook and Twitter, and it's going along massively. Um, tomorrow we've instigated about 34 city protests for this um, huge extradition trial, trial week, um, and there's about 120 events going over in the next week alone. Um, they already started on Friday, so. Um, so what I wanted to say is a huge heartwarm thank you to the Socialist Equality Party and the Socialist Equality Group in New Zealand um, for all their support. I mean really, you know, 20 strong protests and always there or ringing me up at least if they're not attending and incredibly amazing support. And although I personally feel, I mean I'm a lefty, but I personally feel that has to not come from a party, we have to rise up all together and join and unify because there's so many good people who've been brainwashed at this point. We know that we all live in algorithm silos online and all we do really is preach to the converted, um, shadow banned. Um, we know, for instance, with the OPCW leaks that have just occurred and how they're being reported, we basically have a situation where the Iraq war was completely discredited with weapons of mass destruction. And we now have exactly the same situation, arguably worse, we have um, chemical weapons attacks being forged by groups in Syria. And um, unfortunately, part of that was the White Helmets. They won an Oscar. They've been talked about as the Syrian rescue forces and they've been appearing really widely on, on, on your news. But it turns out that it looks like they actually set up the bodies of 40 people, men, women and children, on site in Douma in order to justify basically, you know, pretend that there was a chemical weapons attack there, and thus Trump bombed Syria the following week. And this just really hits it home to everyone now, considering that this story, even though it's been released on WikiLeaks, and a whole bunch of amazing independent journalists are, are reporting on this, Grey Zone, the Duran, Consortium News, we're not hearing anything, not even the slightest mutter of it. In fact, Newsweek sacked their writer, Tariq, I um, can't remember his surname, but he was about to expose it all and uh, as soon as he talked about it, he, he got thrown, away, thrown out of the organisation and that's what happened to Pilger because of his anti-war views of The Guardian. Um, the Guardian I hold highly responsible for what's happened to Julian. Um, right, well, I've said what I have to say. I'm, I'm, we're going to have a protest tomorrow at noon at Parliament and that's part of the 34 city protest which I've really helped um, sort of partly coordinate or at least list anyway if you could call it that um, and I really would love everyone I've got some sign up sheets for email I've never done this before um, but I really really would like to start collecting people's names and who would really like to join us on this um, on this battle and again I really want to thank the Socialist Equality Group here in New Zealand I really appreciate what you've done and for inviting me to speak so thank you our third speaker today uh, is Tom Peters. Tom is a, a leading member of the Socialist Equality Group in New Zealand uh, and a writer for the World Socialist website. So I'm asking to bring Tom in there. Thank you, John, and, and thank you, Alex. And I would also urge everyone who can to attend that protest tomorrow outside Parliament uh, at 12. And um, there's a similar protest happening in Auckland at 12 tomorrow outside the UK consulate if anyone knows anyone in Auckland. Um, now, there's undoubtedly growing momentum throughout the world to free Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning, 
Millions of people have been inspired by their courageous and principled stand. Many young people in particular have only recently learned about their ordeal, thanks to the blackout in the media. Um, however, we've been able, the movement of WikiLeaks supporters and defenders of democratic rights, including our movement, the International Committee of the Fourth International, has been able to reach more and more people and has grown ever more rapidly since police dragged Assange out of the Ecuadorian embassy in London nearly a year ago. An action that shocked people throughout the world with its brazen lawlessness. As people become aware of what's happening, and they are joining protests such as this one, because they do not want to live in a police state that covers up its war crimes and imprisons and tortures those who reveal the truth. This is a thoroughly international campaign because of the immense significance, first of all, of what Assange and Manning revealed, and because people realize the same assault on democratic freedoms is going on in every country. People are being driven to act because it is increasingly clear that the United States and every other major power is preparing for another war, and that the persecution of Assange and Manning is part of those preparations. Governments are intimidating, censoring, and imprisoning journalists and whistleblowers who reveal their crimes because they are preparing for even greater crimes in the future. This year began with the US assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian military leader, which was a criminal action that brought the United States to the brink of war against Iran, which would be even more devastating than the war, the invasion of Iraq. Last week, Turkish that? forces clashed with Syrian and Russian forces in Syria with casualties on both sides. And the Turkish president said uh, on Wednesday that an offensive by his army in Syria is only a matter of time. That's a quote. And he was making his, quote, final warnings to the Syrian regime. He made these threats after Trump issued a statement endorsing Turkey's actions. So the US and European powers have been working for years to overthrow the Russian-aligned Assad regime, and that continues to be their aim, no matter how many people have to die or become homeless. The wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, and the US-backed Saudi war in Yemen have already killed millions of people, and there's now the danger of an even more catastrophic conflict involving NATO, the US and Russia, or China, nuclear armed powers that have enough bombs to destroy all life on earth. It's an extraordinarily dangerous situation. So Assange and WikiLeaks are being pursued so relentlessly and so viciously because they expose the reality of war and demolish the lies that have been used to justify it. The first casualty of war is truth. They cannot carry out these wars for resources, for corporate profit, uh, except with a massive campaign of lies. And that is what we saw with Iraq and the claims of weapons of mass destruction echoed by the entire media. We're seeing it again in the propaganda against Iran, Russia and China. Working people and young people, however, are not stupid. More and more they understand they are being lied to and they are finding truthful information from sources such as WikiLeaks. The growing movement to free Assange is setting off alarm bells among some politicians throughout the world. The Australian Independent MP Andrew Wilkie, who visited Assange last week, warned that what is happening to him will provoke mass anti-government protests. But no one should have any confidence in any bourgeois politician, including those who are now speaking out. In Australia, every party in Parliament is complicit in the persecution of Assange not just Labour and coalition governments that smeared him as a criminal, but also the Greens and their supporters who abandoned him for nearly a decade. In the UK, Jeremy Corbyn, after his despicable silence about Assange during the election campaign, is now speaking out against his extradition, only weeks before Corbyn himself loses his job as the Labour Party leader and hands the leadership over to some pro-war follower of Tony Blair. The utter cowardice of the Corbyn campaign, including on the Assange issue, is the reason that this deranged right-wing Boris Johnson government uh, is now in Britain. 
Corbyn recently said, quote, that Boris Johnson seems to me to understand that there is a principle here that somebody who opens up and tells the truth, as Julian Assange has done, should not face deportation to the United States, end quote. Does he really expect anyone to believe this nonsense? The UK government, if anything, is pursuing a much stronger alliance under Johnson with the Trump administration. What Jeremy Corbyn is doing is trying to get everyone to just calm down and have a little faith in the government, when the entire government and most of the opposition in Britain deserve to be locked up for war crimes. What about New Zealand? Well, some of you may have seen uh, the election campaigning has begun and the extreme right-wing ACT party is campaigning as defenders of freedom of speech. It would be hard to think of a more shameless lie than that. <laughs> Neither ACT nor anyone else in Parliament has said a single word to defend Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning against the most brazen attack on freedom of speech and freedom of the press of our time. And that's because they all support the alliance with the United States. They all support the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's true of the Greens, Labour, New Zealand First, just as much as ACT and National. Jacinda Ardern has been interviewed for the latest uh, Time magazine for a cover story uh, marking the approaching anniversary of the Christchurch terrorist attack. The writer praises Ardern for being a young woman and a mother with a platform that is, quote, built on kindness, acceptance and inclusion and leadership that embodies strength and sanity while also pushing an agenda of compassion and community, end quote. This is a complete fraud. There's nothing kind about this government. It has failed to address poverty in New Zealand and it has strengthened the alliance with US imperialism overseas. Ardern herself has boasted about her good relationship with Donald Trump, someone who has embraced fascists, pardoned soldiers who murdered women and children and glorified them as heroes, while describing Chelsea Manning as a traitor and in 2010, Trump advocated the death penalty for Julian Assange. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that, that Jacinda Ardern, who after all used to work in the office of the war criminal Tony Blair in the UK during her political training, is completely hostile to Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning. The Labour Party here, just as in the UK, is a party of war and big business. After years of attacking immigrants, collaborating with the right-wing New Zealand First Party to foster racism and xenophobia, the Labour Party is exploiting what happened in Christchurch to give the police more guns and to justify internet censorship of, quote, extremist content, which means whatever you want it to mean. These measures will inevitably be used against left-wing and anti-war sources on the internet. Those are the real reasons that the US corporate media loves Jacinda Ardern, the never-ending drivel... All right, hey everybody. We are live with Alex Hill from Wellington, New Zealand. Alex, welcome to the Action for Assange, Free Assange Vigil. Tell us about what you guys are doing today. Right, well, we had a protest yesterday with the Socialist Equality Group. New Zealand has been very supportive for our campaign, but we didn't really want a partisan protest, so we decided to do our protest today. Um, we, on the day that everyone um, was doing them. So right now we're at Parliament, we're, we're which we call the Beehive, because and, it looks a little bit like a Beehive. And, and um, we're in Parliament at the moment, and in Auckland at the moment there is a British High Commissioner, uh, the British Consulate, sorry, um, and same time, 12 noon. So we are literally kicking off the day's events for the whole world, and it feels a little bit like, you know, having collected all those events to list. It's kind of a little bit like New Zealand steering the world from the back end. <laughs> um, a little bit, it feels, feels like that. And it's great that we are the first to see the light. So I guess it's kind of appropriate that we're kind of gathering as many cities and listing them as possible. So that's been my focus. I haven't had an awful lot of focus on doing the Wellington event. So I'm hoping that I'm going to give someone that role today. <laughs> awesome. Alex, what are you expecting um, to happen this week with Julian's extradition hearing? Do you have any predictions or any feelings on it? Well, I do feel like the, the, the mood has changed. Um, can we move away because I'm hardly hearing what's going on? I do feel like 
the, the, the landscape has very much changed. Um, I feel like the doctors have made a massive difference. And um, that's fine. Um, the, the doctors have made a massive difference. Nikki Hager's 1,200 journalists, including Chris Hedges, John Pilger, Noam Chomsky, Daniel Ellsberg, it's just an incredible list of thinkers. And if anyone can ignore that and the doctors, I, I, I just don't know. We've also got lawyers who are beginning to write statements as well about how lawless this is and how we are literally throwing out laws, international laws that were laid down during the world wars. Um, so this is a real concern, throwing away people's asylum, kidnapping them, and then holding them without charge in a Mexican maximum security prison. I can't understand how UK people can be like that. Especially seeing, I think, I don't know if anyone's heard about the numbers, but we're talking 20, 30,000 at least, I think, at the end of that March. It looks huge. Maybe it, um, maybe it was less than that, but it just looks so impressive in terms of turnout. I was really, really heartwarmed to see that. Um, this week, I think what's interesting now is that some new information has been raised, and we promised that we're going to get a whole lot of new information. We're going to start to see the legal strategy. Um, and my feeling is that the Queen, having pardoned Assange, essentially by saying it's too political for me to comment, she's actually done him a fantastic favour by not commenting. But also, we've 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 got other moves being made as well, so that that are similar. We've got you know the the lawyers last week at the hearing releasing this information about Julian Assange and how he was offered a pardon. And of course, the media is misrepresenting that. They would, because it's like Russiagate exactly. 3.0. <laughs> but I really feel that's, again, another sort of indication that we've got two massive pieces of evidence that, you know, it's just obvious, really. <laughs> yeah, um, so, yeah, so the Queen of England wrote a response back to a Free Assange supporter, essentially, saying that she would not get involved in the case because it was a political case. And That's as right. you and I both know, and I'm sure some of the viewers do, the US and the UK have a treaty on extradition, and it says that a political prisoner or somebody who's accused of a political pr crime yep. could not Article be extradited. Yeah, yeah, yep. absolutely. Yes. So that's that open and shut case for most people. But if you need more, there is more. We have um, no legal um, meetings with privacy. You know, that's just fundamental, isn't it? We have all of his materials being stolen. We have the fact that he can't even access his own records to have a defense and that he can't access his lawyers for more than a few hours to talk about thousands of pages of documents. So I think that is another key issue that I, I think we're going to see some movement on. But I'm no political expert. I've read a lot about this. But um, really, my only emphasis for doing all this is because of my kids and me wanting them not to be handed this terrible, terrible disaster, stepping off the cliff. It's going to be very hard to come back, just like Brian, you know, said. <laughs> exactly. So you've been doing events in New Zealand for a while now. Have you seen in, um, support for Julian grow since you started? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, anyone you talk to on the streets now, I mean, there's a, aside from occasional, what would I call, without being rude, weaponized me too, uh, and yes. the military, odd military elderly gentleman who kind of freaks out about the, 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 the privacy thing for the government. I have found no one who's, who's been informed of the facts and have, have gone, no, I still don't want to. So really, it's very encouraging. We, I've only really been doing this probably about two years now, almost. Um, I've seen incredible change in heart of people. Um, and I haven't really put that much focus into getting people here because that's not really my thing. What I really felt like I wanted to do was publicize with the world things because the media was doing such a bad job. Aside from you guys, of course, you're not really the old media, are you? But um, yeah, Alex, I don't know if my most valuable skill to be using. Yeah. Alex Hills is, is the mastermind behind Candles for Assange. Can you tell us a little bit about why you started Candles for Assange and how you're yeah. keeping track because there are just so many events happening today yeah. specifically, but it kind of started uh, around Julian's birthday. Well, it actually officially started his 47th birthday. Uh, we, me and Greg, who's speaking in the moment behind us, me and Greg decided that um, a petition, an emergency, very quick fire petition to the parliament to ask for New Zealand to offer Julian asylum here. Because New Zealand traditionally used to stand up for the little guy. You know, if you think about women's right to vote, women in university, um, homosexuality being legalized, 
can talk about nuclear uh, protests and protesting the French bombing. You know, New Zealand always were these people that stood up, and that's why I was quite proud. I'm British, Australian, and Kiwi, and I was really delighted to be able to move here because I've got very low respect for Australia and Britain at the moment. In fact, I'm on the edge of wanting to burn my two passports. But I mean, New Zealand was a little bit disappointing too because the whole reason I originally got into it was I saw no one was doing a protest here, and that's why I had to step up. Yeah. Um, but basically what happened is on his 47th birthday, we announced that we were going to start this asylum petition. And just over there, there's a viral image you might remember in front of the beehive of candles saying Free Assange. Well, we got well known for that. So we got a little bit of a position. So the following year, we just said, oh, we're going to do the same thing again. Only this time at the US Embassy. Please, world, join us for a free press protest on Julian's birthday, a birthday vigil, candles for Assange, hashtag. And basically, it went completely mental. I think there was only like two and a half weeks from when I said that to the event. And within a week, it was 50 cities. And within two weeks, it was 62. Um, and I was completely overwhelmed and also sleepless nights, a bit like the last few days, trying to kind of feel like I can't let it down. Now I've said I'm going to do it. There's so many events coming, and I'm going to have to try and list them somehow and keep on top of it. But it has been a challenge to do that because, of course, there's lots of easy mistakes to make and you don't really understand some of the languages so yeah. yes i understand that yeah and you <laughs> you are a musician who has used music as a form yes. of your activism can you tell us yeah i know you've been a guest before and we've talked about this and you've played on our show but can you yeah. talk again about why um you incorporated your music into activism for julian assange well i just had someone come up and tell me that julian assange is the new nelson mandela open and shut case you know and if we think about how Nelson Mandela got freed, I think that music played an amazing role, role in that, don't you? Um, Definitely. You know, we, we, we all remember that song, Free, you know, Nelson Mandela. We tried to sing it yesterday, actually, with uh, Julian Assange. But yeah, so that we've got that. We've got Band Aid. We've got um, music. What it does is it makes you inherently look peaceful. It's very hard to corrupt a candle display. It's very hard to make it look like we're violent if I've got a violin out. Um, even if I was intimidating that policeman that time playing right in his face, it was only because he was interrupting us. And it was difficult for him to get angry at me because I'm playing a violin. So you've got a kind of a little bit more of a poetic life, whereas most protesters find that they eventually get corrupted with someone who wants to be violent and, and cause problems to the movement. But somehow the music and the candles, it just keeps it the peaceful vibe. It keeps it, we're not trying to make any trouble. We're, just trying to inform people um, and yeah I think music has the power to heal um, and it has the power to cut through to people who wouldn't normally be exposed to that message yeah, yeah so. and and one of your songs that you played in pub uh, politics in the pub last year yeah. um, Christine Assange actually sent to Julian and he got to see that uh, well yes that's an interesting story because the reason that I thought suddenly that I could be more powerful than I was just sharing stuff on social media. It's because I saw Alex Taylor um, in London, obscure he is on Twitter. Um, I saw Alex Taylor with a violin being arrested outside the Ecuadorian embassy on Australia yeah. Day. He's Australian and his violin, I think temporarily confiscated from the armed hard school. And when I saw that and it went through the entire mainstream media because it was so outrageous, I thought, my God, I, I can play violin. I can I could use my violin to get through maybe just doing some crazy stuff with my violin and um, then my best friends and I are quite musical and he, he and I came up with that song one day and, and literally we jammed it out and put it on Unity 4J, the very first yeah. time with the Muppets playing the jam. That, that, that was an, that an amazing well. song. Yeah, so anyway, Alex Taylor, he wrote a song um, with his violin and a beautiful singer called Maria Milwaukee, I don't know how to possibly pronounce it she's got a beautiful haunting voice and we produced a song called let the light in it was a kind of christmas edition wiki release release and it went nuts i mean yes. like, i don't know how many people but uh really great and yeah so i was playing welcome matilda at that pub so it wasn't my song but it was kind of a homage both to alex taylor for what he did and stood for but also you know a message to julian of course and i was really? absolutely overwhelmed that christine wanted to send that to him. So I think, you know, I feel like if he did get that USB stick before when he was in the embassy, he might might have been one of the last things he got to see before. It's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And your That's song, Let the Light In. Personally, as a, as a 
an amazing kind of life moment. I, mean, I kind of think I broke down in tears when I saw that tweet. Definitely. <laughs> it was yeah. And, and yeah, your song Let the Light In was a, a huge hit, um, not only for people that were following Unity for Jay at the time, but it just seemed to really touch a lot of people in the movement. Yeah. And, and Kathy really Bogan, she, yeah, she saw it and she, I had done a sort of mediocre job of a, of a video edit. It was really one of my first ones. Um, and Kathy Bogan loved the song so much. And my second violin part from New Zealand, we called it the uh, Trans Hemisphere Violin Duet. Um, but yeah, so she loved it so much that she, uh, as an academic in film, made a really beautiful recut of it. And she used bits of my stuff too, but she yeah. just kind of made it better. <laughs> Lovely. Well, Alex yeah. Hill, I will let you get back to your event. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining us. For no letting worries. Us Thank you for you and, and You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and everybody, we are going to be streaming. Um, as many events as we can this evening and into tomorrow. Uh, Andrew Smith, Steve Poikinen, and myself, Christy Doff, we will be in DC. We're starting out at the White House and we're gonna march to the DOJ. Um, Yay. So if, you, if you are in the DC area, come on down and join us. We're gonna start off at noon tomorrow. Um, and then we will be streaming and working with Taylor Hudak who is in London covering the events. Uh, so yeah, Alex Hill, thanks so much. And if you have any last no words, let us know where we can follow you and um, oh, yeah. anything else. Okay, so my main Twitter account is Greenweaver Arch because that's my business, believe it or not. That wasn't meant to be an active business account. Um, but the, the ones I'm using the most for the campaign now are Candles for Assange, the number, Candles for Assange. I've actually just started Rat Bags for Assange just as a little personal joke. But um, uh, yeah, and then uh, on, on, on Facebook, I'm Alex Hills. And on YouTube, I'm Alex Hills. And there's a whole bunch of music I did a rogue speech in Parliament for the World Press Freedom Breakfast on 3rd of May, and that was a bit of a coup too, because I don't think the British High Commissioner was was expecting that, and uh, it was quite a nice panel of people. So, um, yeah, okay, I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, you're fine. Thank you so much. Have okay. a great action and have a great day. Thank you so much for what you do again. Yeah, cheers. Guys. And in the case of The Guardian, the UK Guardian, back in 2018, they wrote a story. Their journalist, Luke Harding, wrote a story where he said that Julian Assange met with Manafort. It was a complete fabrication. In November 2016, there was an opinion piece in The Guardian which said, beware of fake news. What we find is, is that the mainstream media lie to us on many different occasions in true. many different yep. ways. So true. Yep. Lying by partial truth and lying by omission. That is mm. not reporting the facts. Yeah. And it's true. quite clear that none of the mainstream media are here today <laughs> to mark this occasion despite the fact that we put out a media release to them last week, and the only one that published it was Scoop. And I got to hand it to Scoop on behalf of Free Assange New Zealand and other interests. They have been very good at publishing our media releases and making sure that we have a good representation of, or a, a well-published document that we can mm. share around in social media uh, and, and, and for people to see what we're up to. Now there's 1,200 journalists from around the world. They include the likes of John Pilger, New Zealand's Nikki Hager, and many, many more who are saying that um, Assange or, or criminalising Assange's activities is just Hi there, I'm not sure if I'm live now on Candles for Assange, but I just wanted to give you a report. I've been posting a few things from this morning. We've had an excellent protest so far. I guess we've had about 40 or so people, maybe more, over the course of the two hours. Um, but I've also gone live stream to Washington to Action for Assange, who um, showed footage of us as the first protest around the world. Unfortunately, probably Auckland didn't get the same care, but um, I told them that that was on as well. But anyway, I wanted to give you a report because I've just found out something very disturbing about the New Zealand democracy. 
Um, I've been here to numerous, numerous marches. I've been here so many times to protest. And I'm trying to think, I don't remember one where um, we were not allowed to hand out pamphlets. I don't remember one where we were specifically not allowed to collect signatures. And I've only just started doing this, but I have been to a number of protests in the past. Uh, climate, uh, TPP, Monsanto. I've never been told in my life that we can't share information between the supporters, like a piece of paper. I've actually, got, I'm going to do a video one and I'm just going to go around because they can't stop me. I'm going to interview them all and get their numbers on video. But anyway, so we were just informed that the Speaker of the House of this stinking cesspit over here, we like to call the beehive because it kind of looks like one. Isn't that a building of transparency? Look at that. It just screams transparency, doesn't it? Um, anyway, so we were just told that the Speaker set the rules for today and someone was handed a piece of paper which said no pamphlets, no getting signatures, no petitions. And I'm just so astounded. I went in to ask them, is this really the law? Can you show me the piece of paper that this is referring from? And they didn't give me any piece of paper and they didn't give me any law, but they tell me that the speaker set the rules today. So I said, well, do you set different rules for different protesters? And they said, I quote, we just want it to be fair for everyone. I mean, am I actually losing my nut here or, or what? I don't know. Anyway, I thought I had just better report there and say it's been a great protest so far. I didn't have Timothy here playing music with me, so I couldn't do the real lovely song that we normally do. It's kind of me singing this time, but I'll put the video out soon. Um, I couldn't even play the violin while I sing at the same time and I'm not a singer. So yeah, we'll have the footage for you soon. And I've been interviewed by um, not only Washington Action for Assange, but also uh, Maori Radio again, the Wellington office here. Um, and they're very supportive and that's really lovely. And I've also had some photographers from local papers. Nothing major. We were told RNZ was gonna turn up, but no one's come and talked to me. So anyway, I thought I'd just give you that update. Okay, thank you everybody, and New Zealand, kicking the world! The beginning, the sun starts here, eh? Bye!